working on turning a plein air sketch into a studio sketch. And here I've already got a start, but let me show you the plein air sketch that I did the other day. This is just a small sketch in my sketchbook done in gouache quickly. And so I'm using this right now as my reference and um, blowing it up into a larger canvas here. So I don't know, this gouache sketch is probably, um, you know, three inches by, uh, actually, yeah, yeah, it's probably like three inches by, let's say six inches, some, somewhere around there in uh, diameter. And what we're going up now here is, this is 14 inches by 18 inches across. So quite a big change in size. The other thing that we're changing is we're changing mediums. So I did, like I said, that I did this in gouache, which is like transparent watercolor. And uh, here in the studio, I'm uh, utilizing um, oil paint. And so um, I started this uh, two days ago and I've just kind of been working on it off and on. One of the things that uh, I've been trying to work on this in this new year is trying to uh, do art every day. So one of the things that's gonna help me is actually having a setup like this where um, I can just come and, and work a little bit on it at a time uh, and keep going. So um, the first things that I did here was I blocked in the sky, the, uh, the background and kind of doing a basic land. And so we'll kind of try to add some more of these details and textures as we see it in here. Now, one thing that is helpful when you wanna turn a sketch into a piece like this is to take reference photos to use back in the studio. But one of the things that I'm trying to do is I'm actually trying to not use the reference photos at all. Or um, if I do use a reference photo, just to uh, use that reference photo at the very end. So right now I'm mostly just going off of this sketch here and I'm gonna try and utilize that as much as, as, much as possible. Um, I've got a couple uh, bristle brushes, a large filbert and a round, and then I also have a smaller filbert synthetic brush and um, a tiny uh, brush that I might use for certain details. So these are synthetic, so kind of a combination of that. One thing, when, uh, when you do a plein air sketch and you wanna take it back into the studio, one thing that um, can be valuable is to try to use the same uh, color palette that you used before. So when I was out in the field, I used a simple triad of burnt sienna, uh, ultramarine blue, and yellow ochre plus white. And so that's actually the same kind of color scheme that I'm using right now. And uh, I'm just free mixing my palettes beneath here. I don't wanna move the camera, so you'll have to take my word for that. But right now I'm going to mix up um, a little bit of kind of a, a snow color with a combination of some blue, yellow ochre, white, a little bit of all of the colors. When you have a, a triadic color scheme, you can actually create grays and browns by mixing all three of your colors. And um, you can utilize that to then shift it warm and cool. Uh, and in terms of warms, you have two different color variations between burnt sienna, which would be kind of on the redder side, obviously, and yellow ochre, which would be on the yellower side. And uh, mixing all of those three will kind of give you a grayish brown. So this is the color I have right now. This video is live, so if you're watching with us live, uh, drop a comment in the chat and say hello. Let me know where you're watching from. And I also have uh, whether you're watching live or if you're watching later, I have a question uh, to kind of start discussion off, which is what is the most difficult uh, thing that you've ever painted, the most difficult subject, let's say, that you ever painted plein air? Um, I think for me, some of the most difficult subjects that I've painted are when there's moving water. Um, recently, I posted a video from when I was in Colorado and I painted uh, a waterfall and as amazing as that was what an amazing experience it was and I absolutely love Colorado I can't wait to go back uh, but it was so challenging for me um, 
to paint the moving water. And um, something that I haven't done before. So one thing that I like to do, you know, <clears throat> I'm looking at my, at my sketch here and I'm trying to mix up some colors. I like to put down just a little basic color and see what that looks like. And, you know, if I like it, we'll go with it. But I'm kind of thinking that I maybe want to add a little bit more white into this and maybe a little bit more yellow too. But I want to, um, unlike my sketch that I did, I want to actually, um, I, I have the luxury of time here. And so I don't have to, you know, just come in with a single solid color. I can kind of work up and get um, maybe a little bit more refined with my gradients and my colors. And so I don't have to go to like my brightest bright right now. Um, and I, I still want to keep the paint sort of thin. But I also, one of the reasons why I'm trying to use um, my sketch as my reference rather than um, using a reference photo right off the get, right off, right out of the gate is um, because I want, I like the painterly quality that I got and I want to kind of try and maintain that. Um, I also really like the color scheme. So back to, back to the color palette by, because this is a winter scene in some ways, it's um, almost like monochromatic to a certain extent. I enjoyed the um, the color scheme, the muted color schemes of those, the oranges and the blues, and getting to kind of play those off of each other, which was really nice. And um, so it just so happens that that same color scheme really works uh, in oil paint too. And so if you can use a limited palette, I find that that often gives you really nice results. But if you can't, um, Either way, like keeping track of what colors uh, that you are using so that you can come back and, uh, and replicate those. Uh, again, use the same palette, get the same colors. Uh, come in with a little bit of snow here. Maybe I need to lighten that up just a little bit more. So kind of have this neutral gray slightly greenish. Kind of just pop this in here. Really thinking about um, tonal values. I'm thinking about textures. And one of the things that's different when you're going from gouache to oil is that um, the oil paint stays wet and so it has a different texture. I'm going to grab this sketch here and show you for a second. One of the things that I just loved about this and one of the just things I love about gouache is how you can get such nice um, textures and dry brush effects and you're able to like get a lot done, all these nice dry brush effects. Those are actually more difficult to achieve uh, in oil paint, at least they are for me, um, unless the paint surface is dry and um, this is not dry. So I'm sort of having to um, manage the paint in a totally different way, um, utilizing Alla Prima. If you kind of look at this background uh, copse of trees compared to this one, this is a much more soft edge, which is going to help that recede back. Um, but I was able to get these soft edges because it's wet into wet, you know, uh, between the skyline and the tree line. Uh, but by the same token, I, I like some of these effects of the dry brush that are very easy to get in gouache and a little bit trickier to get in oil paint. So there's kind of going to be a push and pull with technique as well. I'm going to switch brushes now to um, this smaller synthetic. And I think I'm going to start mixing up a color for some of the green um, highlights. Actually, before that, I want to do some of the shadows in the tree. So I'm going to mix up a near black, which using these colors, um, ultramarine and burnt sienna, will give you um, a very near black. For a medium, I'm using uh, Gamblin solvent-free gel, although this isn't an entirely solvent-free painting because I did use 
some solvent um, in the block-in stage. I don't always do that, so I'm kind of experimenting with using it and not using it. And uh, sometimes it's kind of nice um, to use solvent, but I also can kind of appreciate um, trying not to use it. So I kind of, most of the time I would say I don't use solvent, but um, I felt like I wanted to try it this time, so. And um, so you can see that this is like a near black and um, I'm going to layer over these blacks with my highlights. And I want to take this off the edge of the canvas. In this case, it's kind of nice that this sky color seems to have kind of dried since painting yesterday. So we're sort of at a stage where it's a combination of wet into wet and um, a la prima and also like indirect painting, which is just a fancy term for painting wet onto dry or painting in multiple layers. One of the things that I'd like to do is to um, maybe, if you enjoy these live streams, I'd like to do them more. I might be doing more of them um, just because uh, I am this year trying to do art every day, um, which is something that I always used to do. And then I kind of got out of the habit and I fell out of the habit of, of making art as frequently as I want to. And so it's kind of something that I want to just get back into my life, get back into the groove of it. And so um, originally for me, I had uh, I had actually you know anticipated one of the goal, one of the beautiful things of of um, doing a YouTube channel is like the, the inherent motivation that it would give me to uh, to do plein air. Uh, and to, to just to do art, I guess, and to like film that process. And so um, in the same way, I could see myself doing more of uh, live streams and um, being able to um, share that process with you guys, but also like keep myself motivated. So here you're kind of seeing some of that dry brush effect a little bit and able to just drag the brush and get more more textures and things uh, which is kind of what I was talking about one thing that I try to do too is if there's a color on the brush um, I look for other places that I can I can use that color which is kind of what I'm doing right now so I'm sort of just bouncing around um, the canvas I find that painting plein air and painting in the studio um, are sort of two forms of, of meditative practice for me. And um, on this trip especially, uh, it was just so meditative and uh, beautiful to really like, you know, contemplate the shapes of these trees, the shapes and the colors and the lines and all of those different um, attributes. And um, it just struck me after I was done kind of how beautiful and wonderful that was. And uh, one of the things that I think is, you know, you, you have that in a different way when you're in the studio, but um, also by the same token, you know, now I don't have the scene directly in front of me 
and rather I'm kind of reliving the experience in a different way with, um, with my, by looking at my sketch that I did. And so it's kind of, in some ways it's similar, it's still quite meditative, but it is also quite different um, because my reference is different in a way. My reference is partially my memory um, and partially this, this painting that I'm doing right now. The, you know, my sketch that I'm looking at. I want to put my um, focal point in this area. And so I want like a lot of high contrast in here. Step back and look at this. Okay, that's decent for now. I'm gonna clean, clean that brush. So some other things to consider is obviously, you know, you probably don't want to turn every plein air sketch into a studio sketch. Um, I think that that's something that uh, maybe you want to reserve for just, you know, those special, those special sketches. So um, I think for me, you know, I, I do way more plein air sketches than I do uh, studio sketches. And you're going to spend most likely a dramatically more amount of time in the studio. And so you kind of have to think like, is this sketch um, something that I want to spend a lot more time on. That's one aspect to think about. I think another aspect to think about is, um, will this translate, uh, in a bigger size or in a different medium? And, um, for me, I think wanting to turn this, um, there's several reasons. So one of them is kind of a classic situation that we've talked about several times on the channel. But like, what do you paint when you don't know what to paint? I'm gonna try this green right now. Yeah, I can maybe lighten that up just a, just a tad with some white. What do you paint when you don't know what to paint? And um, so rather than having to spend a lot of time thinking about what I wanted to paint, what should I paint, etc., allowing myself to say, well, I know what I'm going to paint. I'm going to paint this scene um, that I just did. And um, that has been really useful in kind of eliminating one of those stumbling blocks for me, which is what do I paint, right? Um, I think another thing that made me want to pick this is, the, is just the... Um, the degree to how much I really enjoyed the process, how much this painting um, meant to me when I was out in the field. And so in that way, it's almost like I can kind of relive the experience again. And um, I also felt like the way that the painting turned out was potentially something that I could sell. So if you sell your art, that might be something to think about. Um, on occasion, I will um, get people who ask me if they wanna, they'll see a sketch in my sketchbook and they'll ask me if they can buy it. And um, every now and then I, I do that, but it pains me. Um, and so, you know, it's kind of, for a while I was painting uh, just in watercolor blocks and I stopped using my sketchbook more or less altogether. Um, sort of anticipating that maybe somebody would wanna buy uh, my paintings. But um, I don't know, there's just something about painting in a sketchbook that's like really um, fun, you know? And I was, 
I was showing a friend of mine the other day this painting and some other paintings that I've done in my sketchbook and was telling him that, you know, in a way I view like the completed sketchbook as a work of art in of itself. And so um, I don't love breaking up a sketchbook, but I will do it if somebody asks. But I kind of was thinking like, you know, I could see myself selling this one. But if, uh, you know, if I paint a studio version of it or a larger version of it, then um, I won't have to break up the sketchbook and cut a page out and et cetera, et cetera. I'll actually have, you know, something larger. And then, you know, typically if I am selling, you know, a page of the sketchbook, you can't sell it for very much. And so um, by enlarging it, I was a, I'm able to, you know, in theory, sell this for a little bit more money. Um, so those are some considerations. I mean, one of the things that I thought about was, well, how, okay, I, I'm going to go bigger, but how much bigger am I going to go? And um, that was kind of tough. I thought about doing something quite large. I actually pulled out a 24 by 36 canvas that I happen to have on hand that I wanted to do for, um, for something else. And um, I kind of nixed that idea because I didn't know if it would translate, but I also didn't know the larger you paint something, the longer it's gonna take. And I do love this, um, but I'm not super experienced at painting large. And part of me wondered like, okay, dude, like, are you, are you gonna wanna, how much time are you gonna wanna spend on this? You know, as much as I do wanna, um, I do wanna spend time on it, but I don't know if I really wanna spend like a month on it, for instance, you know what I'm saying? So, um, I sort of settled on this as like a medium size. This is still something that I could uh, sell Hey, CD, what's up, man? Yeah, I painting, painting large, he said painting large is intimidating. Dude, it, it is intimidating. Uh, right now I have a painting that's maybe, I guess it's, it's something like 30 by 40. I think that's the, the dimension it is. And I mean, I, I initially I was like very excited and gung-ho about it. And then I kind of stalled out. And so I sort of anticipated if I went that large, with this painting right out of the deck that uh, that could be that could be quite challenging for me. So this is, you know, this is a good medium size where I start to think about um, what could I sell if if in theory somebody wanted to buy it. I mean, when you get to a very large dominant size at a certain point, you're starting to ask a lot of the purchaser, like when it's above 30 by 40 that's going to be like a showpiece that they're going to have to like, that's going to be the main piece of artwork in their living room, for instance. And that's a big ask. Uh, but if you have like a smaller piece, um, that's easier to decorate your home with, I think. Um, so there's pros and cons to it, but I feel like too, when we, when we plein air paint, most of the time we're all painting small. Right. And, um, and so we just, if you lean into that, you you don't get as much practice uh, painting large. So it's kind of something I want to personally I want to work work more on. So now I'm thinking about putting in some of the highlights over this tree here, and um, let me kind of bust out this sketch again. I'm going to do a longer video I think on the whole process uh, of going this. The, sh the video of the uh, plein air sketch itself should be coming out in the next few days, hopefully. I wanted to get it out today, but uh, didn't have time for that. So uh, right now I wanna do the highlights that went over on this tree. And this tree was like getting direct sunlight. So I wanna kind of mix up. It's sort of like a grayish, tannish color. I would say like similar to this snow color, but um, maybe a little bit more on the green side. And so I'm going to mix that color up now. 
I've really been enjoying painting with the limited palette. And um, one thing I have been doing a lot of is um, pre-mixing my colors, mixing like a, a string of five tonal values. So I'm gonna switch to this small round brush. And um, I'm, I, when I first started learning how to paint, um, I started painting, I guess what people call free mixing. And uh, just, you know, you set out your tubes and you grab your colors and you just mix them with the brush or what have you. And um, I think that that's fairly standard, but more and more I've been seeing people do what's called pre-mixing, where you mix up a value range of uh, different colors. And I noticed that um, when I pre-mix, I get a lot more better tonal values, much more accurate tonal values. And so um, I've kind of been leaning into that. Now it's harder to pre-mix when you're um, painting in gouache. Um, and I've thought about trying to experiment with it. I, I'm pretty sure like almost nobody does that, but uh, I kind of, in, in one sense, I don't know why you couldn't Pre-mix some colors in gouache. I've seen some studio painters, like studio gouache painters, who seem to pre-mix some colors. Yeah. How do you uh, how do you pre-mix your colors? Do you sometimes I'll pre-mix if I if I had a mood or a limited palette in mind, but not often. So do you use a palette knife, and are you like pre-mixing wet uh, wet paint, or do you pre-mix with a brush, or how does that work? I've seen some some people, um, I can't remember the name of the artist, but he would mix up like huge quantities of gouache um, because he painted super large. And I could see like that makes sense if you're painting um, really large, you and uh, you want like a coherence with your with your paint. Um, and I know um, Sarah Burns, she's another popular gouache plein air artist on YouTube who I, I love her work. She ha uh, will pre-mix paints to go into the tube, which I do think is like one way to do it. Um, oh no. I just use a big brush and mix into different wells of, of the palette. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know why you couldn't do that. Um, but I've, I've been thinking about doing it with... Um, Doing it with like the palette knife, I feel like gouache stays wet enough for um, for a while that you could premix with the palette knife, um, especially if you're doing. I don't know. I, I guess I want to experiment with it, and then maybe I'll find out. Oh, it's a terrible idea, <laughs> and then I won't do it again. But uh, that is sort of an idea I've wondered about. But when I did this one, I just did like kind of the standard traditional free mixing. And so um, I'm following that same tactic now in the oil paint. And I, I feel like maybe it's just because I'm more practiced at it mentally. My, uh, it feels easier to me and it shouldn't be. Um, the the, the, the pre-mixing should be easier and it should give you um, better tonal values, but um, that has not been my experience, to be honest. It, it, uh, it's, it's challenging for me. I can't remember the name of um, one of those artists who taught at the Artist League in New York City, maybe a teacher. Actually, I think it was George Bridgman was one of the big advocates for it. Um, and he was one of Norman Rockwell's uh, instructors. And I would be interested to know if Norman Rockwell uh, free mixed or pre mixed. I think I would not be surprised if he pre mixed because his uh, accuracy is almost photographic. His, his paintings are incredible. Um, but I think you can sort of intuit, you can build an intuition with free mixing that's uh, similar to the results you might get.
by premixing, but there's just something systematic about premixing that's really nice. Uh, but I would say, like, in general, going from plein air sketch to the studio, I'm trying to follow as much as I can the same, like, order of things. I start with the sky and then the background and then this ground plane. And um, then the darks and the shadows and the snow and all of that. So I'm trying to kind of more or less follow that same pattern partially because that's like what's in my mind uh, but partially because I feel that that's what will work CD if you're still watching have you been um, have you been following uh, JG's uh, Substack? I'd be interested to know what your what your thoughts are on that it's kind of an interesting interesting thing i saw that he um he recently had like a post on there about um one of the um like american realist painters his name's escaping me now but how he would do like little gouache sketches and then just use memory as his reference um, and so that's partly inspiring this technique too i forget the the artist's name off the top I had beer stat maybe um, one of those guys from the Hudson Valley yeah unless it's a painting done over multiple days intuition is usually enough for me and I mean I think it kind of depends on how practiced you are at that right I mean I remember some of my first plein air paintings and they were quite horrible <laughs> and there would have been no memory you know my my ability to like um, have that sensation of memory totally wouldn't have existed at all. I, like I, I can promise you. Um, but now, um, I think it's a little bit different, but it sort of depends on how locked in I am too. Um, I've really been struggling as of late to like get out into nature like this. I think this painting was such an awesome experience for me just because I, it was like in total isolation, totally alone, um, not, um, no distractions, no people, no car sounds, no city life. And um, it was great. Um, sometimes I think when I paint in, in city and there's a lot of distractions and noises and things, it's harder for me to probably build that memory. It's harder for me to get in the flow state. I haven't followed much of the Substack stuff. Yeah, um, well, he recent, I don't know that much about Substack either, but man, if, if James Gurney is gonna try it out, I'll, I'll check it out. I think it's, it almost honestly seems like he's gonna maybe just move his blog over to Substack. I think Substack is kind of a, it is a blog, but it's, uh, it has a paid element, so it almost reminds me of like a combination of um, a blog with uh, elements of Patreon. So he's been writing posts over there daily, um, and I think uh, six days a week, and I think five of the days are free, and then if you're like a paid subscriber, uh, there's like some other perks, but there's I think his Wednesday post is maybe just for paid subscribers. And um, so I've thought about doing that because I, you know, I believe in what he does and, and I want to support him and I'm kind of interested uh, in, you know, seeing him succeed. And I'm always interested in, in what he says. Apparently he's going to release a new book uh, on gouache technique, which that will give us a lot of uh, a lot of stuff to talk about, I think, on YouTube for, for years to come, hopefully. Um, so I'm excited about that. I'm interested, like, to know if it'll be, like, uh, any different from, say, his gouache in the wild video, or if it'll kind of augment it, or, or what the deal will be with that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. 
he puts a lot of work in research into his blog, so I'm fine with him getting paid 100%. I mean, in a way, it's kind of ridiculous that he, the depth of knowledge that he shares, um, it really is almost like music, uh, like art school type uh, information. And a lot of it is like hard to find information. The art world, as far as I see it, is it's not, it's still not that, that bent towards um, academic tradition. And so it's really hard to find out uh, information. And, um, you know, as somebody who went to graduate school, I can tell that uh, James Gurney does a lot of, a lot of legit research. Like he, he definitely goes back to some primary text. This isn't just like, uh, I don't know, looking something up in plein air magazine and then regurgitating it. Um, but he like goes to original um, texts and then he relays that information to us. So it really is, um, it's it's very personable. I don't think that it's like, so ac it's not per se academic, but that he does, um, he does relay that information that uh, is harder for us lay people to get. All right, so I'm looking at, um, I'm looking at my sketch again. Trying to think about what I want to do now. It's starting to starting to take shape. Um, I could put in some of uh, maybe some more branches here, or maybe just some of these um, leaves. There are a few leaves left on on this. I could do that. Um, I could put in some more highlights in the snow. Um, and the last thing that I did was put in a lot of these like weeds and textures and those aren't as poor, important. I'm not sure what I want to do. I think when I was thinking in the order of things, I had uh, messed up the snow and so I repainted that. Um, I wonder if it might be good to put in my highest highlight here right now to see how it reads. Or I could put in... I think I'm going to put in, I think I'll put in the, the leaves now. So one thing that's been an interesting um, experience it, filming my work for YouTube is sometimes I can, uh, especially when I am blowing something up for the, the studio, there's been a few times where enough time has elapsed where I don't remember what colors I used. And that's where like filming the plein air sketches has been super useful to me to be like, oh yeah, uh, I can go back and I can see what colors I had on the palette and I can I can actually rewatch the footage myself to um, to see what I wanted to do, you know? Now that sky color is still wet. I want to like overlap some of these shapes, the red over the green. I don't feel the need to connect every leaf to a branch, especially like from a distance. Um, you don't always see like every tendril uh, that connects and our eyes really like kind of fill in, we'll fill in some of these little gaps and things. This is pure um, burnt sienna that I'm using right now with quite a bit of medium. 
Um, and that's mostly to keep it from picking up or lifting up if those under layers are still wet because this is oil. Um, one thing that I might try sometime, I don't want to put too many leaves here. And I'm kind of inventing some of these, um, but I'm trying to get that like scattered look. Put some in here. Okay, that that might be okay. I'm gonna put maybe a couple over here. So now um, there were some leaves that were catching a lot of light. And basically I'm gonna mix in white into this now to give a chalkier um, color. We'll kind of highlight some of the leaves I already have, maybe a little bit more whiter than that, to be honest. And um, this is another thing that I like to do, and I'm going to probably try to play this up more as I keep working on this a little bit, is just getting color variety. I think one question to ask yourself when you're going into the studio after a plein air sketch is how much of the freshness do you want to maintain um, or how much do you want to, like, you know, how much of this... Do you want to have it look like a, um, a plein air painting? And how much of it do you want it to, you know, maybe get tighter? Um, are you working from memory as a choice or because you don't have the reference? CD asks. Yeah, so I, I do have reference. Um, I, I try to always remember to take reference if I can. And um, actually, I was talking to a painter friend of mine who actually recommended taking multiple references, which is something I want to try to do more of. Um, like take it at the beginning, take it at the middle, take it at the end, and um, you know, continue to basically, that way you're catching multiple like lighting scenarios. And I really liked that idea. Um, but yeah, for this one, uh, I, do, I do have a reference photo uh, or a couple reference photos and video, which I often will take. But right now I'm just working from the sketch itself as my reference, mostly. And um, and yeah, I'm doing that to see, to, to rely on memory intentionally, I guess I would say. Um, I'm gonna take it as far as I can go, uh, as far as feels feels right with um, just the sketch as a reference. And then I might, I really haven't decided to be honest, but I might bust out the photo at the end um, to possibly just see more details or clean up some shapes. Um, but the thing that's nice about using the sketch as my reference is that my colors are accurate. Um, I know like when I do use a photo, it's a lot harder for me to not get sucked into um, um, going too dark with some of my colors. So I almost want to like use a bigger brush here. I almost feel like this is like too fiddly. I am going to dip into using a bigger brush here. Um, let's see what we can do. This could be a mistake, but the beauty is being in the studio, I can always fix it too. I want to keep things kind of have a looseness to them. There's something to be said for like grouping shapes together. And really this tree is not, um, not the focal point, but I did like how it kind of added um, some variety to it um, in terms of the colors. It's like kind of the only instances of red um, an orangey red at that, which is going to be kind of 
there's going to be a complementary action between these two trees. So I really liked how this overlapped. Um, there's going to be a really bright highlight in here of snow. So I really liked how I could lead the eye with these leading lines of the shadows and then the trees kind of arching uh, this place of high contrast. So I felt like these two trees are bending towards each other. This one being green and this one being red, reddish orange. But then you also have like this band of uh, orangey yellows of warm colors juxtaposed with these uh, cool colors. And so, and you really have a combination of so cool and warm and then cool, warm, cool. And uh, I like all of those aspects of the scene. So that's something that I'm trying to maintain here. I'll go back in with some of the highlights and then we'll see where we're at. Um, I don't have like a any anybody in mind. So one of the other thoughts talking about the size is I I felt like the size was gonna work for like my own apartment or you know my parents' place or my girlfriend or something. So like sometimes if you think about it's it's hard to think about what other people will want sometimes. So you can just think about what you would want and just go for that, you know. Okay, I don't know if I'm making that better or worse, so we'll probably just leave that at there. And I think that'll do it for today, guys. So this was really fun. Uh, thanks for chatting, CD. I mean, everybody, if, you, if you're watching this later, go check out CD Sketch. He's got some of the best plein air gouache stuff going on right now. And um, thanks for watching. And uh, leave a comment down below if this is something that you guys uh, have ever tried. And um, watch soon. There's going to be a full video of both the plein air sketch itself and uh, this completed. So I'll see you guys then. Remember, you have a voice that matters. Go be creative. I'll see you next time.